mangled up. But for the first time here tonight, the terrified victim with a $20,000 price tag on her head. Jeff is dead. No way. Really? Dead? Not quite. But having to play dead and talking only to 2020. At that moment, did you sense you were very close to being dead? Absolutely, yeah. David Muir with a real-life murder for hire. Every step of it followed in real time. If she wasn't going to have him, you weren't going to have him either. The plotting caught on surveillance tapes you'll only see here. Don't think I'm a bad person, okay. but if something happened when the kids get killed, oh well, I'm sorry. Every sick twist of her mind, every minute of terror, once her rival finds out, is she still in danger? Every day I live in fear because of her. Tonight, they're caught in a bad romance. She says to you she feels like she's living a lifetime movie? Yes. Now she's living a 2020. Here's David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Tonight, that murder for hire plot that unfolded in a supermarket parking lot. The 2020 exclusive, the tape's only seen here of a suburban soccer mom plotting to kill the other woman. And tonight, right here for the first time, that other woman who was supposed to be dead very much alive and talking only to us. Even she couldn't believe the plot to kill her until she saw it play out right here. This evening, we head back to that supermarket parking lot with the survivor who had no idea who she was about to meet. First came Howard and Nicole, then came Howard and Jennifer. In this love triangle, two's company, three's a crime. Jennifer's dead. No way. Jennifer's dead. It's like a made-for-TV movie. Why can't you love me? The strange but true love story of Nicole Facenda, ruthless romantic, set in a soprano land of big hair and broken hearts. You want a sandwich? No, I'm all right. The Garden State, where smokestacks grow, where the surprisingly irresistible charm of Howard, a chauffeur, drove one woman over the edge. I want to go piss on a grave. And as you're about to see, it could get another one killed. A 42-year-old suburban soccer mom is about to settle the score by hiring a hitman. It all starts right here. Keep your eye on that white car pulling into a supermarket parking lot. And out comes our leading lady looking for trouble. How you doing? Hi, how are you? Have a seat. I'm here to go shopping, to go get flowers. I have this big event. You know I'm so busy today. I have all of 10 minutes. Okay. She says she's there to buy flowers, roses maybe, with some very sharp thorns. Nicole hoping her problem can vanish like magic. So what can get done? You could just make her disappear. You could, what, what can when get done? Uh, when you say disappear, like you want her out of this state or you want to, you know? Nicole says she and Howie had it all. Fancy casinos, fine dining, first class vacations. An easy life, she says, at her expense until Howie's secret worlds collided. The 54-year-old falling for a younger woman, Jennifer, just 33. Nicole and Howie have a son, but Howie and Jennifer would have two sons. She's just a who's been involved. I think she's like 30 years old. She's got two kids. We have this hatred thing because we're, both, we're both fighting over this complete loser. We both have kids with this loser. So he bounces back and forth. He uses her, he uses me. You don't want to hear the whole You hear Nicole say she wants Howard to suffer, but it's Jennifer she wants gone. I could do it myself, but I'm want, I don't want to be to have my hands on anything. So here in the parking lot in broad daylight, as shoppers push their carts right on by, there is one shopper in the market for murder. I need somebody who can just get something done, then leave and disappear. They have big fat envelope in their pocket. And then my when Howie walks out on Nicole at first, she follows the time-honored tradition of jilted lovers the world over. She turns to Facebook posting family pictures and a furious rant about Howie's secret life with two families. But among those who see the post, one of Howie's relatives, a guy we'll call Sonny, they start chatting online and on the phone chatting about murder. And then in this New Jersey parking lot, it gets real. Nicole meeting Sonny for the first time in person. 20 years, he does everything for me. Sonny introducing his friend to her, the hitman, and we'll call him Jose. You just tell him the scenario and he'll get it done. No the cure for Nicole's broken heart break something else. You know, so you're saying you could just go break her legs or you could go do exactly. anything, exactly. anything that I need done, you can exactly. do. Exactly. From, from the littlest thing to the, the worst thing. thing. The worst thing. Yeah. Nicole and the hitman talking in a code so clever, they're fooling themselves. Okay, 
Yeah. So I heard you had a problem with somebody, and I'm here to take care of your problem. But what is it you want me to do with your problem? Um, okay. I don't know how to fix my problem, I guess. How do I fix your problem? You tell me what you want me to do, and I can see to it that it gets you taken care of. But how is it going to get taken care of? How do you want it to get taken care of? That's why I'm here. And just look at this. Incredible. That man hired as a hitman who we're calling Jose allows us to get in a car with him, too. As long as we agree not to reveal his face or identity, we're interviewing the man she hired. So as we drive this New Jersey highway, do you think any of these other drivers on the highway have any idea you're a hitman? No, not at all. A lot of people are going to ask, why would she ask a relative of the ex-boyfriend to help her find a hitman? I don't know. Maybe she was just desperate. I mean, she didn't know too many, I guess, bad people in her life that actually committed crimes because she, was, uh, she wasn't that type of person. To hire someone for murder is a real serious thing. You don't, you know, just based on looking at her, you didn't really think that she was capable of doing it. So what brings Nicole to this moment? She was just frustrated. She was angered at the fact that he was leaving her and she wanted to get even. She wanted to get even because this whole time he had another girlfriend. And not only another girlfriend, another family. Yes. And she wants to take that other woman out now. Yes. But she wants the boyfriend to live. She wants him to live because she wants him to grieve. She wants to see him suffer. She wants to watch him suffer. Yes. So you're sitting here in the AMP parking lot. Yes. And she's told you she's going to do some shopping? I guess she wanted to make it seem like she was shopping if anyone questioned her what she was doing here at the time. So she's doing a little shopping, and then she comes out to meet with the hitman? Yes. Because that's what most people have on their grocery list. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Back in that parking lot, that prospective hitman worried about the man of the house, Howie. Howie's in the house. Who the dude she's with now? Uh-huh. What's he about? Nothing. Is he armed? Does he have a gun or some No. Nothing. Nothing. He's got a big mouth. That's it. He's not the only one with a big mouth. Listen here as Nicole realizes she should worry about her own. Just trying to make sure you're not like an undercover federal oh, agent okay. and like all of a sudden cars are all over. <laughs> if I get arrested, I'm going to I'm, I'm lose my job. And you're about to hear something else. Nicole fearing she's a star in the making. And I know I've watched one too many lifetimes. I'm in a horrible, lifetime. horrible... <laughs> We've watched too many Lifetime movies. This is, this is about TV now. Nicole's story eventually will attract plenty of agents, but not Hollywood ones, federal agents, among them ATF agent Michael Longhi. There are a lot of times, you know, people will say that they wish somebody was dead, but uh, actually going through with it and wanting them dead is a, a totally different uh, animal. Totally legit. I'm not, I'm not I you. you didn't make a wasted trip. I promise you that. Nicole presses ahead, sharing her own fantasies for Jennifer. I've played every scenario through my head a million times. Do I want the car to go off the, the highway? Do I want someone to just come up and take her out? Do I want me to go into the house with my silencer and take them all out? Like, I've, I go to sleep every night thinking. The hitman is about to give the fine print on the murder contract. No refund, no returns. You gotta be serious right. about the you know what I mean? It, it, because once it's done, it's done. There's no turning back. You understand that? But Nicole, in that shopping center, is about to ask for a price check. And um, what is pricing? Hurt is what? Depends. What okay. kind of hurt? You want hospital hurt? You want coma hurt? You want me to beat this being really? Okay, but what's pricing? If you want a dead, it's going to be five up front, five at the end once it's completed. That's it? Ten? Yeah, you need ten. Federal agent Angela Mullins. So the whole time there are shoppers in the parking lot and there's a murder being planned. And she's planning to kill someone. Murder for hire in America. On your lunch break. But the deal is not done because Nicole wants to think it over. So what do you think? How long do you think you're going to need to think about it? Tonight? Tomorrow? I need a couple days to think. All right. Thank you very much. The meeting ends with a handshake. As they drive off, Jose and Sonny celebrating with a fist bump, like it's money in the bank. But not so fast, because in this supermarket murder plot, Nicole is not the only shopper with a secret. That parking lot is crawling with federal agents from the ATF, and they are hanging on every word. We had a good eyeball on it. We had multiple cameras pointing from outside the vehicle, and we also had some covert cameras placed within the vehicle, which provided both video and audio. So she has no idea that as she's talking to the hitman, you're right here in the same parking lot listening to the whole thing. No clue. When we come back, guess who's in the driver's seat now? Nicole's close-up coming sooner than she imagines. So she says to you, she feels like she's living a Lifetime movie? Yes. Now she's living a 2020. <laughs>
1920s bad romance continues. Once again, David Muir. A sunny afternoon, a New Jersey supermarket, and at the top of one shopper's list, the murder of the other woman. Jennifer, she says, stole the love of her life, Howie. Exactly. Anything that I need done, you can exactly. do. Exactly. From, from the littlest thing to the, the worst thing. To the worst thing. So, which is it for you? Nicole Vicenda says she's shopping for flowers, but what does she really have in mind? A bouquet or bullets for a romantic rival? So far, she is cautious and careful with her words. You know what I want. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. She doesn't want to say it. She has the perfect outfit in mind. Today I'm dressed in black at the funeral. I'm handing you an envelope. And that's Nicole is him. clearly nervous. At first, suspecting her new partners will skip the dirty work and do a double cross. Take the money and run. Or worse, pull out a badge and slap on the cuffs. An undercover sting. Just like she's seen before on TV. I'm sorry that I'm crazy watching two great lifetime movies. That's all right. If only Nicole had followed her own intuition. Because that hitman we're calling Jose, he's got a gun all right, but he also has a badge. He's working undercover with the ATF. He's not a stone cold killer, he's a cop. You're actually a good guy in all this. Yes. And so is Sonny, the guy in the back seat there. In fact, he's a longtime confidential informant for the feds. But Nicole doesn't know that. All she knows is that he's supposedly the black sheep relative of her ex-boyfriend, Howie. So she's thinking of the darkest person in her life, the person who might know a hitman out there. Yes. And it just so happens to be, what, a distant relative of the ex-boyfriend? Yes. And little does she know, he's an informant. Correct, she did not know at all. As for Jose, he's a seasoned officer, but as a hitman, he's just a novice. This is his first case working undercover on a murder for hire. 18 years a cop, is this your first time playing the role of a hitman? Yes, it is. And this is your rookie run as a killer? Yes, it is my first time. Are you at all nervous? I wasn't nervous with her. I was just more concerned about saying the wrong thing to mess up the case. So what you're most nervous about is not being a hitman. You're nervous you might mess up the case. Yeah. But even while he's in that car, Jose gets some help. Watch as he looks down at his phone. She's going to do something to you, so you want to do something to her in return? He's reading a text message from the other agents in the parking lot. So the undercover and I were actually communicating via text messaging. Agent Michael Longhi, listening from a nearby car, now texting his tips. We're able to point out things to the undercover in live time, and we were able to go back and forth, so say this or do this, just to kind of help him along. And just listen to how Jose explains those text messages to the suburban soccer mom sitting right beside him. He tells her it's just a friend texting about going out for a beer. Asking about the beer. And then the moment in that surveillance video that struck us, when it seems Nicole is on to the undercover hitman. And I know I've watched one too many Lifetimes. I'm in a horrible, I'm horrible... Sorry. <laughs> We've watched too many Lifetime movies. This is, this is about TV now. So she says to you, she feels like she's living a Lifetime movie? Yes. Now she's living a 2020. Yeah. Jose is part of an elite squad of undercover hitmen working for the ATF all across this country. You're armed with disguises today, but you're also armed, right? Are you armed at all times? Can you show me? Earlier this year, those undercover federal agents agreed to sit down with us as a group for the first time ever. Perhaps you'll remember the 2020 exclusive, because to do it, they spend hours getting disguised. That's Jose right there, covered in a sort of goo before he gets a brand new appearance. They would make a mold, and from there, they build new features for his face. The same agent who would sit in that car with that scorned lover. And the less you know about me, the better it is. How do you find a hitman? I mean, you're not on the elevators, you're, you're not on Craigslist. They'll actually try to reach out to the person they feel knows somebody that has something to do with the criminal element. Or it happens when you're doing other undercover cases, you're working a group or a gang, and they reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, I, I have this problem. You know, do you know anybody who would, who would kill this guy? So it's a great opportunity for us to step in and say, well, yes, we do. <laughs> What's the darkest thing someone has asked you to do? Had a daughter that wanted to kill her dad. The guy wanted me to kill his wife. He said she might be with her mother. Uh, if she's there, just kill her, too. Well, how did he refer to the mother-in-law? He said that is there, just kill her, too. 
two for the price of one? More or less, which I thought about raising the price, but she said I could blow up the house, um, kill everybody, as long as she could get her dog out. So get the dog out, kill everybody else. Kill everybody else. What are people looking for? I mean, what do they want in a good hitman? Just like you'd go to find a plumber to come to your house and fix a pipe, they're looking for an expert to take care of their problem. Do you find them unpredictable, dangerous? I think they're the most violent people on the planet. <laughs> you do? Absolutely. And in many cases, the clock is ticking. The clock is definitely ticking. The person that's hiring the hitman might change their mind and say, you know what, I'll just do it myself, and then they go kill somebody. Does it make you think, what am I doing? You know, I didn't sign up for the Boy Scouts. I signed up to be an ATF agent to go after the most violent people out here. And what's going through your mind when the person across from you wants someone killed? You just wanted to yell at it. Like, what's wrong with you? I mean, what are you doing? When someone's being so evil next to you, it's like, how can you even conceive of something like this? And you, you have to sit there with your poker face and, okay, this is what you want done. This is what I'm going to do. He would keep that poker face, and so would his partner. Because two nights later, another parking lot, another criminal conversation. This time, Nicole meeting with the hitman's sidekick, Sonny. Tell me what you want, though. You I want this problem gone. You know what I want. We're right here in the parking lot also. Those ATF agents are listening again. You're out here listening in the car. Yes. Now we're actually sitting in pretty much the exact spot and we set up our surveillance vehicle just on the other side of this curb. So we were literally about 10 feet away in a blacked out vehicle that she was not able to see. So this is where you're listening to her? Yes. The informant's got a live wire? Yes. And for the first time, she's not holding back about what she wants done to this woman? Not at all. No more talking in code. Nicole lowers her guard and spells out exactly what she wants. See, I, like, would think that either she disappears and she's just never found, like these people are never found. Okay. Like, that would be one good thing. I wouldn't care if she was in a horrible, horrible, horrible car accident okay. and mangled up and, you okay. know, I don't, I don't care. Like, gone. I want to go piss on her grave. I want to go to her funeral and spit in the gas. So you want to see her dead? Is that what you said? I will be happiest when this woman is dead and buried and sick. And when asked what to do with the ex-boyfriend, it turns out to kill the woman, keep him. So she says, get rid of the woman, but keep the boyfriend alive? Yeah, she said, just injure him. You know, shoot him in the foot or something. What's the thought behind that? So that she could still potentially be with this man after all of this. She'll swoop in, you know, she'll get the satisfaction that he's hurt and his despair. But then with the victim out of the picture, she can have him. And you're thinking the whole time? She's crazy. She's maniacal, just cold. It's unreal. It's, life is stranger than fiction, and this is why. And we were listening to it live. Right out here in this parking lot? Right here. One man, two women. It seems Nicole figures it's just a subtraction problem. One murder to make the math work. But perhaps darkest of all, listen to Nicole, a mother herself, when asked what to do if the other woman's children get in the way. Two innocent young boys, the children, the man Nicole says is the love of her life. I don't give a shit. Like, let me tell you, I don't think I'm a bad person, okay. but if something happened and one of the kids get killed, oh well, I'm sorry. When we come back. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly. Jennifer's dead. No way. Jennifer's dead. The double cross, the details they share with her that the other woman has been killed are greatly exaggerated. In fact, you're about to meet the other woman who is very much alive. So what do you think of Nicole and her murder for hire plot? We're live tweeting throughout tonight's show, so let us know using the hashtag ABC2020. When we come back, the intended victim, stunned by news of the murder plot, but not who was behind it. I knew right away, if anything happens to me, it's Nicole. And later, the hit is about to hit the fan. I can't believe you did this. Don't show up here. That's not, that's not cool. When Bad Romance continues. Twenty continues. Here again, David Muir. The morning she is scheduled to die, Jennifer Schwab is actually on her way to work. Up before dawn, out on a dark and lonely road. Something frightening coming from behind. A car following her. And tonight, for the first time, she's coming forward to tell her story. Tell me about the morning you left. Were you going to work? I was, yes. Every time I left my house, I would check 
outside to see if there was any unfamiliar vehicles. And that one morning, I looked across the street and there was a black car that was across the street. They followed me. So you're wondering who it is behind you? Yes. I was on the phone with my mother and I said to her, Mom, let me call you back. I'm getting pulled over. I got pulled over. So the lights go on. The lights go on. And you're thinking, I ran a red light or? I'm thinking I'm speeding. I'm being caught on the phone. I didn't know what. They're behind you. They start walking after the car. Yes. And you roll down the window. Just a little bit. How do you tell someone that there's been a threat against your life? But, uh, you know, we wanted to reassure her that we were there to protect her. The ATF officer places his badge against my window and says to me, are you Jennifer? And I said, yes. And he says to me, Jennifer, there's been a hit for your life. I remember clearly saying it flat out told her there had been a threat against your life. And, you know, we were there to protect you. And immediately I said to him, Nicole Facenda. And uh, I think that stunned the two of us because, you know, I didn't know that she knew of such a threat against her. But obviously it was something that immediately came to Jennifer's mind that Nicole was someone that was looking to harm her. So you knew right away? I knew right away. I um, even had said to my, my people I work with, my friends, my family, if anything happens to me, it's Nicole. So I knew. She says she had always been wary of Nicole and knew she could be trouble. But could you ever have imagined this? Uh, I thought maybe it would just be a flat tire or, you know, a broken window at the house. I never thought that she would go to the extent as she did as to try to find somebody to murder me and my family. Jennifer says Nicole never really had a chance with the man in the middle, Howie. Howie's double life, the two timing, the cheating, all in Nicole's head. According to Jennifer, who says Howie was always hers. What drives someone to do that? Jealousy and anger. She wanted him. She wanted him. She wanted him from the time that I met him. But what you're telling me is that she never really had him. That's correct. But don't forget, Howie and Nicole have a child together, a son, 11 years old. And at one point, when Howie and Jennifer break up, Howie moved back in with Nicole. There was a lot of pressure in our relationship, and Nicole made it easy for him, manipulated him by saying that she would help him financially, and, you know, that she could do things for him that I could not do. And that hurts. That hurts to know that because of money and greed, um, you know, he left and went to live downstairs in her basement. And for those of you who might be thinking Howie is a two-timer, Jennifer says he's not. The double life that people said he lived is not the double life he lived. But she wanted you wiped off the earth. Yes. And when you hear it from her own mouth. Don't think I'm a bad person, okay. but if something happened to one of the kids get killed, oh well, I'm sorry. How did you react? Hurt, anger. I can't fathom how somebody, a mother, Nicole being a mother herself would want to do to myself, my family, and my children. Jennifer never saw the surveillance tape of that murder plot unfolding in that supermarket parking lot until she saw those tapes play right here on 2020. I will be happiest when this woman is dead and buried and six feet under. She said she'll be happiest when this woman is buried and six feet under. Mm -hmm. It makes you so angry to hear those words. I led my life. I raised my kids. I didn't do anything to deserve this at all. Does it sound like something out of a... A quote, Lifetime movie? Absolutely, it does. Nicole never got the best of me. I'm too strong for that. And that's what I really think made her go to this extent of trying to murder me. The agents take Jennifer into protective custody. Her first instinct to check on her two young sons. I wanted to make sure that my family was safe. But she's not allowed, because now it is the agents who want Jennifer to disappear, part of their own plan, taking her phone, cutting her off from the rest of the world. You couldn't make any phone calls? I could not make any phone calls, Because no. they told you this plot is unraveling right now. Correct, yes. And we need you. Yes. Because what those agents are going to need is for Jennifer to play dead. We needed to kind of close her off and, and really simulate 
what it was that we were trying to affect. There's always a threat, which is why we still had to bring her into our protective custody and keep her pretty much dark from her family and her friends that day so that we can go ahead with the rest of the story that the murder had been committed. When we come back, you'll see the moment Nicole's murder plot backfires. Wait until you see the look on her face when the hitman comes calling. Twenty twenty's bad romance continues. Once again, David Muir. It's almost curtains for Nicole Vicenda's murder for hire drama. Her plot to kill her ex-boyfriend's new lover, fatally flawed, and about to flop. Hi, Hi, how are you? Have a seat. The hitman hired by the New Jersey soccer mom is a cop. His sidekick is a snitch. The ATF is watching every move, building their murder for hire case. The would-be victim, Jennifer, now part of the case, getting ready to play dead. But Nicole knows none of this. She thinks everything is running according to plan. Nicole so eager now, she doubles the fee, putting a $20,000 price on Jennifer's head. And look at this, the photo she texted to Sonny and Jose, making sure they kill the right woman. And then she texts the picture of the girlfriend. Yeah, it doesn't get any more serious than that. Tonight, right here, for the first time, we hear the flurry of phone calls that follow those parking lot meetings. Sometimes Nicole, the soccer mom, calling from the sidelines, just a few feet away from where her child is playing. I'm at the soccer game, and my sister is here, too, with her kids. So when she walks over, I hang up. The hitmen wonder, once their deed is done, when Jennifer is supposedly dead, how will they prove it to Nicole? When she's finished and gone, how are you gonna? And how how can I show you that she's that she's gone? I don't know. You gotta figure that out. I have no idea. Picture? I have no idea. Picture. That's the only way I can do. I, I I can get him to get give you a picture of her dead, finished. You figure out how to give me proof. And you know the only thing is that the only proof I have is um, when I go to the funeral, I'm gonna be happy as. Their solution: a gruesome souvenir, a photo of her dead. But Nicole has a better idea. I don't want a picture. I'm going to get blasted with a picture. I don't want any pictures. I'm going to go to the funeral. She doesn't want a picture. She wants to go to the funeral. She wants to go to the funeral. She wants that satisfaction, knowing what she's done, and kind of savor it, which is quite sick. So seeing the casket, she thinks is better proof than any picture. Absolutely. At the end of the rainbow, when it's all done and finished, you'll pay him the rest, correct? Then at the end of the rainbow, you know, we all figure it out, absolutely. When you see a bullet in her head from a picture, finished, will you have the money ready for him? Bottom line. Um, yeah, I will when it's, when it's done. Nicole is now one step away from closing the deal. She'll make a down payment, the balance due after Jennifer is dead. Murder on layaway. They set up another meet at a local restaurant, but she has no idea those ATF agents will be there too. So you're right here at the Olive Garden, people are having dinner, and you're waiting for her to show up with the cash. Right. And you're waiting, and you're waiting, and she's not here. Exactly. And no sign of her. No sign of her. Concerns racing through their heads. Has she changed her mind? Does she now want out of that Lifetime movie? Or worse, has she taken action on her own? Suddenly, she's calling Sonny. Hey, where are you? And where has she been all this time? At her son's soccer game. And she's now pulling up right next door. And where is she? She's over at the Exxon. Over here. She's now just a few hundred feet away. Okay, he's moving, he's gonna go now. The agents scramble, their wires, their cameras out of position. Listen, he's gonna have to walk over to the Exxon station. They see Nicole hand Sunny a thick envelope. Mm -hmm. And what's inside? Her down payment, cash. How much cash? She did $2,000. So basically, it's a down payment on murder. It's a down payment on murder. Because once this money was received, we knew at any point that we could, in fact, arrest her. The agents have heard enough, but still no arrest. Nicole allowed to drive off. They want more evidence for an airtight case as the murder for hire plot now enters its final hours. Next, the next call I, I, I'm going to do to you is when f she's gone. She's 86, dead, finito. That's it. Once you're dead, you're dead. You follow where I'm going with this? Yeah. Nicole at work at that New Jersey hotel, getting the phone call she says she'd been waiting for. The hit on the other woman. Sonny, the hitman's helper, is on the line, calling to say the job is done. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly. Just call me. 
he did what you said to do. Jennifer's dead. No way. Jennifer's dead. He shot her, he said, um, shot her in the head. He has proof to bring you whatever she's done. She's dead. Sonny tells Nicole the hitman made the murder look like a botched robbery. You said to get rid of somebody. He shot her, made it look like a robbery. He wants his money. He's going to go to your hotel and get it from you. I don't care. He can come here. It's not here, and I don't have anything here. Nicole doesn't seem to believe it. He did what you said to do. He killed her. He wants the money. Okay, you have to calm down. You have to calm the hell down. You're telling the boss. ATF agent Michael Longhi and his team still tracking the case, watching and listening to it all. She didn't believe the murder hadn't been completed because she was making phone calls and actually watching on television to see if a murder had been committed. Nicole will see if she can fit paying off the hitman into her busy schedule. I'm at work since, since before 10. I have to go to two more appointments. I can't even be bothered in these two appointments. I, I will call you when I'm done with these two appointments. I got a 12 and a 1. And then I will call you after that. Nicole at work, not knowing she's enjoying her final moments of freedom. The ATF agents send in Sonny, the informant, still playing the part of the killer's helper to see what Nicole will do, what she'll say. I can't believe you did this to me. Don't show up here. That's not, that's not cool. I don't believe either one of you at this point. I don't believe either one of you. But Nicole's day is about to get much worse. So she's working here at a restaurant. Yeah, she's a catering manager. And she has no idea that you're about to move in. No, no clue. So you come around the front here, and you and you walk right into the restaurant. Yeah, we walked right into the double tree. And you ask for? And we just asked for her at the front reception desk. And she comes out. And she comes out, and she was just questioning and looked, you know, so surprised and startled. And what do you tell her? We tell her that she's being placed under arrest. So you cuff her and you haul her right out of these doors here. Yes. And what was she saying in the car? She was like, I can't believe this is happening. And she was starting to get teary. And she was like, why, why, why? She actually had some tears in the car. Oh, yeah. In the back seat. Yes. Nicole, not a killer after all, just a grim weeper. Were those tears for the girlfriend she tried to have killed? No, they were for herself. You'll remember our hitmen who are, in fact, undercover federal agents. When you're in that courtroom and you see the person that you've caught and they look at you, what do you read in their eyes? They hate you. Hatred. That person trusted you with everything, and suddenly they find out that you have betrayed them. I enjoy that part. That's the part where they know they've been had. You did your job. It's the only time you can actually come out of your role and just be like, yeah, you know, I got you. Nicole eventually pleading guilty and getting 10 years in federal prison. And from that prison in West Virginia, she is reaching out to 2020, sending an email saying, I thank God every day that no one got hurt from my careless actions. I would like to apologize to the victim and her family. I am not and have never been a violent person. I was a woman destroyed by emotions and I am paying for it dearly. And Nicole also accuses the feds of baiting her. I was at an emotional low point in my life and they took advantage of that, she says. But that hitman reminding us in that supermarket parking lot, he gave her several outs. You gotta be no, serious about you know what I mean? Because once it's done, it's done, there's no turning back. You understand that? When we come back, the reason Jennifer is afraid it'll never be done, why she fears Nicole, even from behind bars, is still a threat. Because you think she's still determined. Yes, absolutely. And an emotional moment in that supermarket parking lot where the plot began. We'll see who Jennifer is about to meet. continues here again David Muir murder can be hard on a relationship the plot to kill Jennifer and when she learns it's her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend Nicole Facenda who wants her dead that's a little hard to get past you almost pay for this with your life this guy's got to be some incredible guy and is Howie like the best thing going Howie's a good guy he's a good father um, he's very caring um, you know, unfortunately, he got involved with uh, Nicole, and it all came down to this. As it turns out, even from behind bars, Nicole may have gotten some of what she wanted. Howie and Jennifer, they're on the rocks. So you and Howie are still together? We are working through things for our children, for us, for our families. So you can't say for sure whether there's a future or not? I'm not sure. 
we're working it out. And was it the death threat when you finally said, you know what, I'm not sure this is going to work? It was a lot of things. Too many things have happened. Yes. Yes. And now you feel like you can't erase it. I don't know. But one thing Jennifer does not blame on Howie is the murder plot. Howie didn't do this. Howie didn't tell Nicole to hire somebody to kill his family. It was all her, and I can't hold Howie accountable for that. Howie turned down our invitation to do an interview, but he did tell us in a phone call that he still loves Jennifer immensely and wants to stay with her forever, 100%, he told us. Jennifer, meanwhile, is still looking over her shoulder. There's a moment when they're in the car and they're, they're talking about the ways they can kill you. Yes. And she says, I don't care if she's in a horrible car accident. And they rolled up and, you know, I don't care. Like, gone. Do those words still play out in your mind? All the time. All the time. Everywhere I go, I have to be worried or concerned that somebody is going to drive me off the road. Or somebody is going to come to my door with a silencer, as she said she wanted to. I'm scared every day. Because you think she's still determined? Yes, I do. And Jennifer says she has cause for concern. Nicole denies it, but agents say even after she was arrested and in jail waiting for her trial, a cellmate informed them that Nicole was plotting another hit on Jennifer. She even said at one point that she knew her life was over and that now she was really determined to make sure that the victim didn't get to live. And she went as far as to make arrangements with her so that the cellmate's husband himself could in fact commit the murder. And then our drive with the woman who was supposed to be killed, we reached the spot where that plot was hatched. The suburban New Jersey supermarket. It was a day like this, and she's sitting here in the parking lot plotting your murder. Coming here just makes me very emotional, upset. This is where it all started, that my life was going to end. And you've driven past this store I before. I have, yes. Never in your wildest imagination thinking there'd be a plot for your life here. No. And when you pulled in the parking lot? Just a lot of emotions. Just the thought that two and a half years ago almost that I could not be here, that my children would be motherless. And this is where it all started. And for that undercover killer, the hitman we call Jose, the hits keep coming. You could be on a new case tomorrow. Yes, I can. Or today. Or today, or after this, who knows, yeah. Wherever the job takes me. And when you look back on that, that rookie case, are you relieved it's over? Yeah, I'm glad it's over. I mean, she, she got honestly what she deserved. 10 years. 10 years is a long time.